course, it goes without saying that Roman power was brutal. The fact is, all ancient cultures were horribly brutal in our standards. The campaigns of Alexander, the so-called Great, unmentioned by Boris, the Athenian massacre at Milos, unmentioned by Boris, and the wars of Julius Caesar in Gaul, understandably unmentioned by Boris, seem to me to make a pretty much a score draw when it comes to sheer nastiness. And uh, even the Greeks, by the way, as soon as they discovered gladiatorial games, they went for them absolutely fantastically, and they converted all their nice stadia into gladiatorial arenas. But happily, this isn't. They did. I'll show you where. What in Ephesus? One. <laughs> but this isn't a contest in niceness, because if it were, we might not find a winner. My support of the Romans rests on quite different things. It's about how they grappled with issues of civil liberty and electoral politics, how they managed to service urban living on a vast scale, and how they consistently incorporated rather than excluded people, whether that was offering a role for women, almost unknown in the ancient world apart from Sparta, or whether it was welcoming migrants and creating new citizens. In fact, I hope that everyone will take away tonight one date that should rival 1066 in the consciousness of the British, and that is 212 AD. It's the year when the Emperor Caracalla gave full Roman citizenship to all free inhabitants of the Roman Empire who didn't already have it. That meant 30 million people got Roman citizenship at a stroke. It was the biggest grant of citizenship in the history of the planet, and it made everyone, even in this backwater province, fully and formally part of the wider world. Right, but let's start with liberty. <laughs> Libertas, the distinctive Roman watchword meaning freedom from impression, freedom in law, and the freedom of the individual in the face of the state. The watchword that powered the greatest revolutions of the modern world, the American and the French, Liberté, Egalité, and Fraternité had nothing whatsoever to do with ancient Greece. It's entirely Roman. But liberty for the Romans was not just a simple Periclean slogan. Leaving aside all the kind of pontification, the real point for me is that the Romans were the first people systematically to debate the, li the limits of political liberty. They faced head on the unanswerable questions that matter now to us most, is how far should the rights and the freedom of the individual citizen be suspended in the interests of homeland security. The big moment for the Romans came in 63 BC when the consul Cicero claimed he had unearthed a terrorist plot to eliminate the government and to destroy Rome. He executed the presumed terrorists without trial. At first, he was heroized, but soon he was exiled precisely because he had used the provision of a Prevention of Terrorism Act to justify summary execution. And they put up a shrine of liberty on the site of his house. Romans wrangled about that forever after, and they used arguments that still provide a framework. When we discuss Guantanamo Bay or drone strikes on British citizens who are fighting for ISIS, and they've never been more pointed than they are in this week. Those Roman issues are our issues. They were barely raised in ancient Greece. Liberty is not, of course, as Boris would say the same as democracy. And Romans never claimed to be a democracy, um, which was a kind of newfangled, old-fangled Greek invention. But liberty did underpin a form of popular power in Rome that lasted longer and started earlier than the short-lived democracy 
of ancient Athens, which soon became under the, uh, the overarching power of the royals in Macedon, uh, never mind all the Greek cities that were never democracies at all. For half a millennium from 509 BC, the Roman people were the sovereign body in the state with the freedom to elect whoever they wanted. Now, you only have to listen to Cicero's brother offering advice on how to canvass for election at Rome to see how we have inherited the Roman brand of politics. Here he is. I must tell you now about the other parts of your campaign, in particular, how you get the electorate on your side. You have to learn the knack of remembering people's names <laughs> and an easy manner. You have to be seen everywhere. Be generous and get a good reputation. And you have to have a, a, create a sense of hope for the future of the country. Whatever else you do, make sure you recognize the voters. Or make it look like you do. <laughs> then just suppose there's some desirable quality you don't have. Pretend you do and make it look natural. <laughs> Flattery might be a pretty shabby thing in general, but when you're standing for election, it's essential. And make sure that you have a face, an expression, and style of conversation that matches the different expectations of the people that you meet. People like to have things promised to them. So if you're asked to sign up to something you can't do, either extricate yourself politely or promise it anyway. <laughs> the former is the mark of a good man. The latter, the mark of a good candidate. <laughs> the other thing you have to think about is your reputation and public opinion. Make sure you put all your efforts into being a good canvasser and, and, and make sure that people talk about you as being a nice guy, that they're always coming to your house, that you look the part, and that the electorate feel they're sharing in your fame. Your campaign has to be glamorous, but you have to dig up the dirt too. If you can, see that some accusations of crime, expenses fiddling, or a sex scandal are thrown at your rivals. <laughs> it is to the Romans, in other words, that we owe not so much the invention of dirty dealing, because the Athenians had been great at cheating in elections, but that wry, down-to-earth realism about how electoral processes operate. In fact, one little Greek princeling in the second century BC observed how canvassing went on in Rome and was so impressed that when he got back to his own kingdom, he actually tried going round the common people and shaking their hands, uh, trying to win their support. All it gave him amongst his own Greek subjects was the nickname Bonkers. Right. <laughs> but let's move on to the city itself. Classical Athens was a very small place. There were perhaps 40,000 people, not all citizens, living in the city itself. That makes it roughly the size of the University of Manchester. Rome, by the first century BC, is a multicultural, bilingual world. As many people speaking Greek as they spoke Latin as their first language. And the city of Rome itself was the home to a million people. It was the biggest city in the West until 19th century London. The Romans were committed to make urban living, modern style, work. And in modern style too, they were committed to moaning about the tribulations of city life. And here's the curmudgeonly satirist juvenile complaining about not being able to get to sleep. Insomnia causes most deaths here. The complaint itself being brought on by indigestion. Rich food lying on a stomach sore with heartburn. Show me the apartment that lets you sleep. In this city, sleep costs millions. And that's the root of the trouble. The lorries thundering past through those narrow, twisting streets. The oaths of deliverymen caught in a traffic jam would rouse a dozing seal, or even the mayor. <laughs> if a tycoon has an appointment, he rides there in a big litter. He can read or take notes or snooze as he jogs along. 
Those drawn blinds are most soporific. Even so, he outstrips us. However fast we pedestrians may hurry, crowds surge ahead. Those behind us buffet my ribcage. Poles poke into me. One lap swings a crossbeam down on my skull. Another scores with a barrel. There are various other nocturnal perils to be considered. There's a long way up to the rooftops, and a falling tile can brain you. But think of all those cracked or leaky vessels tossed out of the windows, the way they smash, their weight, the damage they do to the pavement. You'll be thought most improvident, a catastrophe-happy fool, if you don't make your will before venturing out to dinner. Each open upstairs window along your route at night may prove a death trap. So pray and hope, poor you, that the local housewives drop nothing worse on your head than a bucket full of slops. <laughs> That, I want to argue, is not idealism, that's realism, and that is us, right? We have such an affinity, actually, with that kind of thing, that one-man shows run successfully in the West End for weeks and weeks, just reading that stuff out to us. It's only one side of the story. Rome devoted itself to organising big city life, and Boris knows just how hard that is. Right? They invented traffic rules, they invented planning legislation, they had running water and public lavatories, and if anyone thinks that's trivial, I suspect you ought to imagine what it might have been like going to the loo in 5th century Sparta, and you might think that Roman public lavs were a lot better. And Rome was the only place in the ancient world where the state took responsibility for ensuring its citizens had enough to eat. And just a matter of invention, it is worth saying that Roman concrete, as in the Pantheon, produced a span of a dome that was not equaled till the 1960s. Right? Because top of the Roman agenda were the practical issues of living together and how you make a human community work. Finally, <coughs> Roman society incorporated those who were mostly excluded in the ancient world, most obviously women. In classical Athens, for all the blasted democracy, women had a ghastly time, they were often segregated, and they had few rights of any sort. They didn't have any formal political rights in Rome, but they did actually sit down and eat with men. They were allowed to go out in the street unveiled, and they had more economic independence than any women have had in this country up to the late 19th century. But there were other ways in which women were on the map. Almost all the literature written by them in Rome has been lost, and we can blame the medieval monks for that, for not copying it out. My favourite one would have been the autobiography of Nero's mother, Agrippina, which I think would have told us quite a lot about the life right, of the court. It would, would have undermined your argument. But... <laughs> But it'd be good to have, you know. What does survive from Rome, what does survive, are all kinds of attempts, admittedly by men, to construct a variety of female voices in Greek and Latin, not just suffering heroines, ridiculous parodies, or lovelorn females. So I'm going to ask you to try this spoof letter written in the third century AD and ghosted for a feisty prostitute, complaining that her favorite lover has given her up in favor of philosophy. <laughs> Ever since you got it into your head to study philosophy, you've become a frightfully serious kind of guy with those horrible knotted eyebrows. You wander off to the university with some old book in your hands and you walk right past my place as if you'd never seen it before. You've gone mad, my boy. Don't you realize what kind of person that professor of yours is? 
who looks so dreadfully severe when he delivers those amazing lectures to you students. How long do you think he's been pestering me for a date? <laughs> when he's already wrecking himself with the lovely Herpolis? I turned him down because I'd rather sleep with you than take the money of all the professors in the world. But since he seems to be putting you off me, perhaps I will ask him in, and then I'll be able to tell you what that perverted old misogynist is really like. Anyway, do you think a professor is really that much different from an escort girl? They have different means of persuasion, maybe, but honestly, they have the same aim, earning a crust. <laughs> We girls are much better and more God-fearing than the profs, though. We don't say the gods don't exist. We believe our lovers when they swear they love us. And we don't think men should sleep with their sisters or their mothers or even other men's wives. Maybe we seem not quite up to the academics because we don't know where the clouds come from or what atoms look like. But no one who spends time with us ends up dreaming of revolution or overthrowing the state. In fact, they tend to stay in bed rather late in the morning, sleeping off the night before. You might even say that we are better than the profs at educating the young. For after all, God doesn't give us very long to live. Don't waste it on riddles and academic nonsense in that ivory tower of yours. Now for me, that is Roman culture all over. It's fun, it's warm, and it's raising more important points than you might think without all the fuss and pretension. It's asking, how do people learn? Does philosophy really make us better human beings or not? But ultimately, it was not just the incorporation of women into the state, into a role in the state, but it was the incorporation of new citizens into the state. Rome had a mechanism for becoming Roman. Now, classical Athens had such an exclusive and narrowly ethnic, you might almost call it racist policy, yeah. on who could become a citizen, that if we were using their rules, I'm not even certain that Boris would be a UK citizen. I mean, you were born in New York, weren't you? I think that could be a problem under Pericles, right? And what we would have lost. <laughs> But in Rome, what Caracalla did in 212 AD, 212 AD, was only the final act in a long process, which started when the founder of Rome, Romulus, welcomed refugees and asylum seekers to his new city by the Tiber to be proper Roman citizens, and which carried on as citizenship was spread among those whom Rome had at first conquered, and when people from far afield became Roman emperors, Trajan and Hadrian from Spain, Septimius Severus from North Africa. That could never have happened at Athens. And at the same time, slaves in their millions were freed at Rome, and in the process, completely unlike in the Greek world, they became full Roman citizens. Many fewer slaves were ever freed in Athens or any of the Greek states in which we know, um, and if they were freed, they certainly didn't become citizens. This was an incorporating community. Now, some observant people in Greece early on spotted these weird habits of the Romans, and they were amazed. A few of the smartest began to think that maybe Roman openness 
was the secret of her success. And that's what I think, I think, too. I think Rome's real, Rome's rough, it's in your face, it's open, it's welcoming, and it's us. <laughs>